I'm Ashton Addison from Event Chain for Investment Pitch Media and the Crypto Coin Show. And today on Blockchain Interviews, we have John Gleason, the COO of Storage. John, welcome to the show and thanks for taking the time to be here. Hey, thanks for inviting me. This is a great uh, venue and I've uh, got a lot of great news to share. Yeah, I'm really excited to dive into all of the recent news that Storage uh, has just come out with. Um, and I would love for you to kick it off for the viewers that aren't familiar with the details of Storage with a high-level overview of what is Storage doing in the blockchain space and, and what are the solutions that your team is providing? Yeah, absolutely. So we are a uh, cloud object storage service for developers. And what we do is we make open source software that anybody can run. Data centers, prosumers, businesses, and those businesses have uh, many times extra hard drive capacity in their data centers. If they run our software, they can share that extra capacity with us. We aggregate it, and then we make it available to developers as an S3 compatible storage service. Um, mm -hmm. So it's uh, it's sort of your alternative to Amazon.com in the decentralized space. Mm -hmm. And today our storage capacity is sourced from uh, over 11,000 different independent people all around the world running our software. And so that it's a great sort of story for decentralization because we're able to provide a great competitive service on a huge number of uh, different nodes in I think uh, 96 different countries now. Wow. Very cool, John. And w when I when you f when I first looked at storage platform, I saw decentralized cloud storage. And as a consumer, my mind goes to you know consumer storage. But that's not the route that storage has chosen. You're choosing more cloud storage for developers, which obviously in the blockchain space is, is highly needed right now. But can you talk about why is that that you're not focused on consumer data storage and, and developers is is what's needed? Yeah, absolutely. So in in, in sort of the 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 world today, we, we're if we're competing against you know the drop boxes and the boxes mm -hmm. and and that sort of thing and trying to reach consumers it's it's a lot larger number of people that we have to hit and market to and a lot of different sort of things that we have to build to be competitive that maybe aren't core to what we're offering mm -hmm. but by targeting developers we're getting to that same customer base just indirectly right so by providing mm -hmm. a great service that's 80 percent cheaper and allows developers to build more private and more secure applications um, we can target those developers, we can get into those applications, and we can reach all of those end users ultimately without having to uh, to really do do that that part of the work, which is trying to break through in the consumer space and also mm -hmm. deal with the um, uh, the support issues that you have with the commuters, uh, consumers, you know, past recent and all that stuff. So developers are really a great target for us, uh, and so far so good. It's working out great. That's great to hear. And uh, yeah, that does sound like the right route now that you have explained it. And I know storage in the last week or so has had some huge announcement, huge announcements, uh, big changes. Can you give us some insight into the announcements that your team has, has just made? Yeah, absolutely. So um, we, we've gotten uh, some really great traction over the last year with with the service, and we've got uh, a, a ton of feedback from developers. Basically, that they love the idea, right? They love the distributed storage, the security, and the privacy. But what they wanted was. They wanted to interact with us the way they do with every other cloud storage provider. And what that means is introducing an S3 compatible gateway. And mm -hmm. it's a really big challenge to do when your storage is spread over 11,000 different storage nodes. But um, we spent the last uh, eight months or so working on that. And at the same time, um, we got some feedback that uh, some of the brand decisions that we had made um, were confusing to the developers as well. And so what we did was we launched a new brand. So we're launching under Storage DCS, uh, Decentralized Cloud Storage. Uh, we're offering that gateway service. Uh, along with the gateway service, we've uh, introduced multi-region high availability for every single component of the network. We've launched new pricing. Um, so now we are the lowest cost provider uh, for any storage um, provider on the market today at $4 a terabyte for storage and $7 a terabyte for egress bandwidth. And we've introduced a oh. free tier, uh, 150 gigs of storage and bandwidth for developers so that they can try it, uh, get started with passion projects or whatever, and then grow into that with, with larger projects um, as they move forward. And so it's just sort of that total package of new brand, new product, new pricing, and free tier. Mm -hmm. So it's it's a lot, and, and the reception has been excellent. That's great to hear. And yeah, I, I was curious about the pricing and when I think of decentralized storage, and I think you know at the Ethereum blockchain, just storage and transaction costs, it seems like it's not cheap uh, compared to potentially a, a centralized solution. At least that's what I'm thinking in my head. But I'm guessing that your team has found a way to make it cheaper than uh, these high transaction fees on Ethereum. How how is there a trade-off uh, between the costs in the decentralized ecosystem versus the Amazon way? Yeah, so so interestingly enough, the, the traditional way to go about delivering cloud storage is you build a building, right? You have the data center, you fill it full of racks and people, and you park uh, a bunch of um, 
uh, internet pipes into it and you sell your cloud storage or you rinse, leather, repeat. And the number of people that can actually do something like that is terribly for you, right? I mean, you have to be at absolutely hyperscale to be able to even enter that market. Mm -hmm. And so decentralized cloud storage lets you enter that fray, but in a completely different way. Instead of a ton of uh, CapEx up front, you can do it with OpEx. And so what we've done mm -hmm. is essentially crowdsource that same storage. So instead of building data centers, we've tapped into the latent storage all around the world. And so that's our advantage. So we don't have that upfront cost and we don't have that ongoing yeah. maintenance cost of those things. We're able to pass that 80% savings on to our customers. And at the same time, we're also able to make it really economically rewarding and viable for the people who bring storage nodes. So about mm -hmm. 60 cents of every dollar that we take in goes back out to the network. Um, so wow. it is really uh, an interesting way to approach it. We think of like the Airbnb for hard drives and it's just, it's subverting that model the way it's always been done, but yet delivering that same service with an enterprise SLA, high availability uh, at a cost point that can't be touched. Definitely, and yeah, when you remove that overhead and decentralize it, there's obviously a lot less cost there. Uh, and you, you mentioned one of the advantages in the beginning of for the developers is more privacy, more security. Can you talk about what's the difference uh, in, in using storage and, and why it's more secure? Yeah, so decentralization has a lot of um, sort of advantages from an architectural perspective when it comes to cloud storage. And some of those are actually the byproduct of just what you have to build to have a decentralized platform mm -hmm. at all. So when you're running a bunch of your architecture on the hardware that belongs to people you don't know, you have to have things in place like strong encryption and you have to have mm -hmm. um, redundancy built in for erasure coding. And these sort of things that are foundational to being able to encrypt data client side and then encrypt it and the metadata break it up into tiny pieces, store it across a bunch of storage nodes and be um, impervious to the fact that you could lose a bunch of storage nodes and still maintain the high availability of the data. That's fundamental to our network, but then we can turn that around and expose that as features to developers. And a mm -hmm. couple of those things are, are really great. The end-to-end -end encryption, where we never have the encryption keys, we don't want the encryption keys, we don't want to know what's stored on our platform. That end-to-end -end encryption uh, gives developers one key to making more uh, secure and private applications. The second one is we delegate authorization out to the edge. And what that means is developers can create applications for file sharing where no storage component knows any usernames or users of the application at all. All we know is that a request has come in and it's either valid or invalid. We don't know what the data is. We don't know who the person is. Mm. And all of that granular level of access can be done through the application, uh, through the client application by developers and the tools to do it are super easy. Mm -hmm. And so that's that's kind of the, the the key there is being able to handle all of that access management without any, any risk of creating leaky buckets or thinking that there is a creepy storage company that is out there mining any of that data, right? It is because of the fundamental architecture of the decentralized applications, it's impossible for us to get at that data. Um, and then we turn that around and expose it as feature set to developers. Mm -hmm. Very cool. And yeah, there's been you know, controversy about storing, you know, cloud storage in a centralized way is really just storing your files on somebody else's computer. Um, yeah. and, and if they have access to it, then you're really giving them your files. Um, so yeah, that's been a, a major to topic of discussion. So it's really interesting to hear about the security functions and, and the privacy. And I'm sure the developers are much more aware of that uh, than the consumers, and they probably like that function over, over the traditional services. So that's great to hear. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. And go ahead. Yeah, it was just going to say, a lot of that feedback has been, you know, it, it just like you were saying, it goes back from the consumers of those applications to the developers and then back to us. And not only have we had to build those features set, but we've also taken more of a privacy oriented posture. And so we've mm -hmm. ripped all the third party trackers out of our system and all of that good stuff and really tried to take this privacy first approach, you know, from from company culture to marketing initiatives all the way through to the products and features that we expose to developers. Mm -hmm. That's great. And are the developers that are using the service all, all running their own validator nodes? Uh, and because you mentioned there was like 11,000 plus nodes, is there other people that are just running nodes but not using the service? And is it really easy for anybody to just start running a validator? So it's, it's interesting. So what we did was um, we made a, a design decision early on um, that was really driven by the audience and the people that are using the platform. And with most decentralized projects, you have a single node that's handling all of the functions and you run a node if you want to participate in the network. And what we found was that most users fell into one of two categories. They either had hard drive space that they wanted to share with us, or they needed to store data for an application. But the overwhelming majority of people did not have both needs. Mm -hmm. And so we actually split out the, the peer classes into three different groups. One that handles sort of the uh, the metadata and the intermediation and, and figuring out what storage nodes data goes on and, and, 
storing the metadata for the different objects that are stored in the platform. And then you have just a thing called a storage node. And if you have hard drive space and extra bandwidth, you can run a storage node and that's all you do. You set it, you forget it, and it stores and lets people retrieve data. And then we have a developer client that takes the form of a S3 compatible gateway, developer library and a command line interface, and also a bunch of tools that have kind of plugged into like FileZilla and Rclone that lets you upload and download data. Mm -hmm. And so if all you need to do is store data, it acts like any other developer tool, right? If you've got a tool that's compatible with uh, Amazon's S3, it'll work with storage, generate credentials mm -hmm. and away you go. And so by breaking the network up like this, it really makes it easier for developers um, mm -hmm. to just get started because they don't need to run anything. They don't need yeah. to do anything. They just need to treat it just like every other thing out there. And that's part of the, the, the sort of the combination of the architecture decisions we've made and mm -hmm. understanding of the audience that we've got. And so the feedback has consistently been just, just look like those other services out there, but be better. Mm -hmm. And that's the approach we've taken. Yeah, and I think that's a great approach, John. And I could totally understand how developers, they have a mission uh, with their data. And it's almost like if you wanted to force everybody uh, who wanted to use Ether to run a full node when they just wanted to make a transaction, right? You don't, and, but there are exactly. people that want to run nodes and have incentives to do that. And they might make a few transactions, but the majority of the people that are using the service aren't necessarily going to be running those validators, validator nodes. So there are obviously a lot of people that are already running a validator nodes for storage, which is great. And I'm guessing that that ties in with the storage token. Um, can you talk a little bit about the storage token, uh, how it's used within the ecosystem? Yeah, absolutely. So um, the storage token is a utility token. And it's really there to facilitate transfers of value related to storing and retrieving of data. And so, um, again, it, it, to make this as easy as possible to developers, developers can make a choice to choose either in uh, to pay with a credit card or to pay with storage token. There's an incentive for them to choose storage token to pay with. And then mm -hmm. at the same time, what we do is we actually pay the storage nodes with storage token. And storage is available on, on a, a couple dozen different exchanges, so it's really easy to uh, convert storage token into something else if you mm -hmm. don't want to store data or just use it to store data on the platform. Um, and we've really seen uh, a lot of advantages in terms of using the storage token because we have, you know, uh, geez, 12,000 of these things in 96 different countries. Some of them are making, um, you know, just a couple of dollars a month when they first joined the network. Others are making uh, $1,000 a month. And mm -hmm. the key thing here is that we can do all of that payment uh, through the storage token. We're doing that with a standard payment processor it would almost mm -hmm. uh, eliminate a lot of the value. Now we've seen you know the impact of the increase in ETH fees lately, and that's that in some cases that's been a little painful. I, I will fully admit that. Um, but some of the things that we are doing are working with uh, companies like uh, Matter Labs, uh, zk Sync mm -hmm. to do an L2 payout solution, mm -hmm. and that is turning out to be a really uh, excellent alternative, and it helps uh, you know put the power of um, you know the, the transaction uh, processing in the hands of the storage nodes. It allows us to do more efficient payment uh, terms. But yeah, it's. Um, it's a fantastic way to sort of bootstrap the network and handle all of that payment processing. And it's great to see the Ethereum network sort of moving along and, and, and to take a leadership position with some of those L2 solutions to really streamline the cost that's associated with those payments. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's definitely great to hear that you're taking advantage of that as well. And it seems so many different platforms are needing to use L2 uh, on Ethereum. And we'll see how Ethereum grows over this year, hopefully. Uh, some of these improvements will help with that, but at, at least w there's a lot of adoption. It sounds like you guys have a lot of people in your network that are utilizing it, and that's great success towards widespread adoption. And with all of these updates that you've your team has just put out recently, and the rebranding, and, and listening to your developers, um, I'm guessing you're just going to continue on with listening to your community. That's obviously important. But what would you say is going to be one of the key factors to the widespread success of storage for years to come? Yeah, I'll tell you, there, there are a few things that, um, that are going to really drive the, the, the needle for us. Um, probably the biggest thing is going to be channel partners, right? So finding ways to help, um, you know, find applications that have end users and, and scale very broadly um, and, and really establishing uh, traction within the channel partners. Um, the free tier is another thing that's really critical to mm -hmm. our growth because it gets people to sort of look at it and go, I don't know what decentralized cloud storage is. It sounds intriguing, but, um, you know, I just want to really try it before I get too far invested. And so it's it's that gateway to, to let people try it. Um, and then, of course, you know, driving forward with, um, you know, some of the, the incentives that we can use for uh, for using storage token um, to buy storage and really make it even more economical for end users. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, we're, we're 
so far so good knock on wood we're seeing a lot of great traction uh and, and a huge burst already with uh with the new features and the new um branding and pricing model mm -hmm. that's great john and for people that are interested in learning about the validator system or trying out the free tier and just other developers that want to learn more information what's the best way for them to get involved in the storage community and to get started uh, yeah, so they can check us out at uh, storage.io at our website. Uh, they can join our community at forum.storage.io. Um, and our documentation, docs.storage.io, is also a great place to start. And of course, you can just go to the website, sign up for a career account, and get immediate access. And mm -hmm. uh, we've got uh, really great docs in terms of getting started and using the platform, and a lot of good case studies coming out right now in terms of companies like Plask, um, uh, FileZilla, and fire, file base that are doing you know really good work integrated with the platform and taking advantage of centralized storage already great well i will leave those links in the description box below as well for the viewers thank you so much for taking the time john today to speak about storage all the best with the platform moving forward and let's follow up in the near future awesome thank you very much appreciate the time and have a great afternoon